Welcome to the WT FFF Special Series, brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP, where your hosts, Tom and Tracy Hazard, explore the all about the what of 3D workflows from concept to print. Hey everyone, welcome back to WTFFF in this special series sponsored by HP. I'm Tom Hazard along with my co-host Tracy Hazard and today we're going to talk about VR 3D design and boy this is exciting and it's actually a very unusual episode format for us. Yeah, it's jam-packed because we're ha we have three different companies, three different aspects of VR um, related to VR 3D design as an overall process, but also to 3D print. So VR 3D design to 3D printing, like all of that process in here. And so we're really breaking it up into three pieces. First, we're going to talk about uh, the sort of design side of it by talking to uh, Gravity Sketch. And then we're going to move into users of it, who's combining visualization tools and other things to do that sort of space visualization, product visualization, all of that utilizing VR technology. And then we're going to talk to Joanna Popper from HP to talk about some of the technology that they're using all along the way to develop the tools to utilize in the visualization process. And then for all of us to go out there and of course have some fun and check it out later, right? So we're going to, we're going to do that through the whole process. You know, it's, I was a VR skeptic, Tom. You know that. Like <laughs> once upon a time, once upon a time, I was a VR, VR skeptic. <laughs> and then you went to a VR conference and you came back, and I'm like, "Who are you? What what happened what to you?" Because I mean, seriously, it was like you were brainwashed after you got back from this conference because you were so taken with VR and such a proponent of what it's going to do. Well, and I'm going to broaden that by saying XR. That's what I was taken right. with. I was taken with the idea of AR and VR and sort of this, you know, mixed reality idea of, of combining the things as well. And then also adding into that, that 3D print visualization component and like really being able to, and this is the ideal for me. And this is what got me so jazzed and excited was that we we're going from something that just seemed so much gamer oriented to now being someone that was so more application oriented and us being able to utilize in the design process and someone like me without detailed heavy duty CAD skills could get someone to visualize what's in my head, to be able to push that together, to be able to show that to someone, to be able to walk around that and then be able to have them take that from there and do that final engineering and the detail work and the things that were needed or, and or get it out to the printer, right? And so like the idea that that meant that I had to have less and less technical skills and that only needed to rely on my design and creativity skills, that's really valuable to me at the end of the day. And that's why we really are highlighting this VR 3D design process because it allows those things to happen together because I can push and I can pull and I can touch it and I can point to it and I, I can communicate better in creating the design result that I'm looking for and the product result. Well, so VR, AR, XR now, as you say, Tracy, has come a long way. And there are some real practical applications for design of products. There are practical applications and software for visualization and helping to, you know, communicate designs, huge projects in less expensive ways to get budgets approved or to, you know, get to make things happen. Uh, much quicker, less expensively. And then, of course, the hardware, the computer, you know, hardware itself has come a long way. So after these three interviews, Tracy and I are going to be back at the end of that to have a little discussion on our final thoughts about all of these guests. But Tracy, who is it we're going to talk to first? So we're going to talk to Shay Sosanya from Gravity Sketch. Um, Shay is a London-based engineer, design engineer. He's passionate about traditional forms of making, which I think is so valuable because if you don't know how stuff is made, how are you going to design tools to make it, right? And he has mass production experience, digital production process experience. He holds an MSc in Innovation Design Engineering from Imperial College of London, where he met his co-founder, Daniel Paredes Fuentes, and he's the CEO of, of Gravity Sketch. Um, that he's focusing on the challenges today's traditional digital tools have to empower designers of all disciplines at all levels, right? <laughs> to become more creative by transforming workflows. His mission is to make emerging technologies more accessible to the broader creative community by building tools that lower barriers to entry with human-centric user experiences. Wow. Well, with an intro like that, I can't wait. 
to conduct this interview. So let's go there now. Hey, Shay, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Tracy. Well, I, you know, this has so, been so interesting, this whole series for us and getting to explore new technologies, new software, <laughs> new hardware, all kinds of new things in the, in the process of just producing this episode on VR, um, XR, as we, we termed it from our last conversation. So how long have you been working in this industry and when did you found Gravity Sketch? Yeah, so uh, we found Gravity Sketch in 2014. And it was actually on the back of a thesis project. So I, I was a returning professional to academia um, with a background in uh, design for manufacturing. I worked for a really big original parts manufacturer in Taipei. And so I had a, a really close experience with like what it takes to bring something to market and all the different CAD uh, cycles that you have to go through with the design team to the manufacturing. And um, one of the things that we wanted to do uh, in academia was like see if there's a bridge between design and, and, and CAD and engineering world. And we felt that everyone speaks through sketches, but those sketches are 2D. And we, you know, as an industrial designer, we sketch in a more emotional, expressive way. And as an engineer, we, we tend to do the plan views, the three views, and maybe an isometric view. And so if there's a way to sketch in 3D, there's literally no miscommunication there. It's just what you see is what you get. And so that was the kind of the nugget of what we wanted to, to address. Yeah, a lot more valuable, but, but time consuming, as you know. <laughs> well, what's been fascinating to me in in learning about your company um, and seeing a lot of the, the videos that you guys have posted about how your software works that I have not unfortunately had the opportunity uh, to actually try it myself. But a number of years ago, we were able to try some things with Microsoft and the HoloLens and some really rudimentary creating of 3D objects in, you know, a VR environment. And at the time, I mean, it was fascinating, but struck me, you know, that it wasn't very intuitive and, and they hadn't really worked out a lot of the user interface. Whereas watching videos of what your software does, it seems very natural. I mean, yes, you have to learn how to use the controllers and what you know buttons and commands are gonna do things, but I can really see how drawing in that 3D space, sketching, as you say, is just a, a really freeing experience. Mm. Um, and I'm fascinated by it. You must have spent a lot of time experimenting, trying to figure out what was going to be the most intuitive sort of ways to create objects. Can you share some about that development? Yeah. So during the development phase, we really did want to strip away most of that interface that we see when we jump into even like a Photoshop or a, a CAD package where you have drop down windows or a command that you need to type or a hotkey. And we wanted to focus on the creative experience itself. So picking up a pencil and putting it to the paper, everyone knows how to do that from my four-year-old niece to my mother, who's a school principal. So what we want to do is just figure out how does that, that experience translate into 3D. And since we use our hands and we gesture, there's kind of like we have like a foundation that we can build an experience on top of. And so we came up with a couple of rules that guided us through how we implement the user experience. One of which was everything that the user does has to be physically based. So gestural interaction was a really a fundamental thing for us because we did want to span that chasm of people's skill levels. We also wanted to have pretty much minimal to no language in the application. So there's no need for you to read something or click, click, click to access a feature. And then there was the last principle that we wanted to implement was this immediacy. So when you're creating in traditional CAD tools, you might define a spline, then a center line, and then punch in the number of a degree of rotation that you might want to rotate it around that center line. Now that's like three steps. And can we cut those three steps out with one fluid stroke? And so all these things were kind of the guiding principles for us to go through that process of defining what the right UX scheme is. It's, it's also very helpful that we have industrial designer and manufacturing engineer as the founders of the company. So, you know, we have quite a, a breadth of experience in both the Photoshop world as well as the CAD world. But we don't want to be the only guinea pigs. So being at really close proximity to our university, we were able to kind of crowdsource a lot of testing. And so we would have these open nights where we'd set up VR. Back in 2014, it was very novel, right? So you'd set up an Oculus DK1, and then in 2015-16, you'd have the HTC Vive, and you'd just put people through that experience. And what was great is that you had a swarm of students who are looking at, you know, in the master's program, thinking about how they redefine their creative workflow, how they redefine their artistic 
approach. And so they're experimenting. And I, I can't stress enough how important I feel uh, students, artists, designers are when testing out an early stage product because they're actually looking to stress test this thing. They want to push it to its limit. They, they're not falling back on conventional norms. They're not constrained or confined by industry. And at master's level, you get a flavor of people who have been in industry before and, and really want to run away from it and people have never been in industry before. And so they just kind of completely free. So that also helped us govern like what was working, what wasn't working. But, you know, we've That's been so interesting that you're saying that, Shay, because, you know, this is what I was the thought was going through my mind for like one of my next questions for you, which was that, like, how do you get these in, entrenched industrial designers and engineers who are so used to their technology and their CAD to switch, to, to look at the opportunity where someone like me who basically I have great design skills and all the all of that, but I usually express it sketch it right mm -hmm. to Tom and then he takes it for the rest of the way or we and we collaborate from that point forward so like our process was I was so frustrated with learning CAD because it was too time consuming for me that it in inhibited my part of the creative process so I could see how someone like me would be like this is I can take this on mm -hmm. I could I could learn this but I could see someone who's you know very used to their CAD program being reluctant so what mm -hmm. did you find as you were as you were testing it yeah absolutely so one thing that we don't want to do is we don't want to replace CAD. That's not at all in our agenda. So Tracy, your role with Tom is, is very much still in, intact, but the, the distance between your idea and the finished product is much closer because you're actually handing off a 3D sketch to Tom. He totally gets it when he pulls it up in, in whatever CAD software he's using. And more recently, we we started to build integrations and bridges so that you could pull up a Rhino, fi a Rhino file out of a Gravity Sketch file directly. So you can just edit it at Tom, Tom's native environment your native fluid sketching environment. Ooh, that sounds like fun because now, now you're talking our language here because we do happen to be Rhino users in, in this I office. I suspect so. he might have looked. <laughs> he might have noticed that. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's that's great. I you know that that I think really invites that collaboration because so often that's what we've found over the years that the engineers and the designers and the manufacturers like they all get into their silos and they really aren't speaking the same language and the design has difficulty in communication unless you're extremely good at the communication process mm -hmm. and that's what we've had to hone over the years in order to get through the vision and keep it moving through the process yeah, exactly. On both sides, uh, we both sketch and, and that sketch is nothing but a communication tool. I mean, we're just communicating what's in our brains. We, you know, use the most immediate means possible, which is 2D at the moment. But with the advent of this technology and, and the accessibility of this technology, we're able to do all that napkin doodling all the way through to like a really nice resolved industrial sketch all in 3D, which removes the need to do like seven or, or eight different perspectives, right? It does. You're right. You know, and that's one of the things that I found very exciting, um, you know, studying your software and seeing examples of objects that, you know, people have created with it is I, I really see the, the benefits, the, the creative benefits of literally just being in this 3D virtual environment and drawing in three dimensions, not just in two dimensions all the different tools and then the way you manipulate certain things like i was thinking back to you know some of the office chairs that we've designed that have you know a mesh fabric but a, a plastic molded frame and, and creating that frame and seeing some of the tools you guys have created where when you're drawing and creating you know these forms how you're able to push and pull them manipulate them and then have it simultaneously be uh, symmetrical, you know, yep. and, and even as you're drawing, I mean, it, I was thinking, wow, that'd save a lot of time. You would, you know, <laughs> an unconventional cat, it can be very hard sometimes to create the actual form that you have in your mind's eye, but here it seems so easy to create it. Absolutely. What, what we see, at least what I experience as well as a designer and engineer is that once we move into the CAD phase or we want a digital 3D prototype, we actually start to land things that we're not quite comfortable landing yet, like what's this radius here or how thick should this be? I mean, we're still in that kind of fuzzy phase and we want to stay in that phase a little bit longer and to be able to carry that into 3D is, is quite powerful. And that, that way you can push and pull things and so that when you get to the, the point where you need to 3D print it or, or bring it to physicality, you can then address, hey, actually we need to thick, thin in this wall. We need to you know, thicken this up a little bit here. But if you start from you know, the, the, those units and those dimensions, it, it does kind of stifle the creativity, or at least it stops fully 
being able to express yourself. So there's a there's a nice little like area between the 2D and 3D CAD world that we think this sits really nicely within. It sounds like it. You know, it's also occurring to me that, you know, Tom and I are very used to working remotely with our team. So we have a big team over in China and things like that, that we've used, utilized from time to time. And you can't always be there in person to collaborate. And right now there's a lot of remote working conversation going on. So does this um, have a multi-user virtual component? Like, can we collaborate uh, using it at the same time? Absolutely. So we've been actually testing this in a silo with one of our customers in the automotive space, and they have a design team in, they have a design team in Turkey, um, one here in the UK, as well as Detroit. And you could probably guess, when it's, it's only a number of companies. That have been <laughs> okay. I'm going through my role. I used to work yeah. in the auto industry, going through yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's been great because what, what, it wasn't really a technology constraint so much, especially with like the, the small size of data that we're, we're actually producing in, at, at Gravity Schedule, our file format. It was mainly around the actual culture about this of design and, and you know, what does, how do I restrict you from moving this curve but allow you to move this curve, right? So ah. some of those problems that we were trying to solve and that's, right. and that's you know, that's really what's, what's held us back from deploying this at a wider scale. But really great news is by the time this airs, we should have, um, a, a beta version that's accessible to just about everyone in our network. So it, I, it should be testable for you guys in the very near future. You know, that that fascinates me because we have had those issues before where the manufacturer wants to make adjustments to it, but they go too far, right? Mm -hmm. And, and and you know, they create a use constraint or a problem with what we intended the consumers to be able to do. And, you know, it takes really watching the drawings, really watching the process. So if you could constrain those ahead of time and make sure that they can't be adjusted, then they have to be innovative and figure out a workaround. I yeah. love that. I love that idea that you're taking it to that level. The other question I had is like, you know, you were talking about your niece being able to access that and your, you know, your mom. And I love that uh, broad age range. Is it accessible from a pricing standpoint too? Is, is it, are there various levels of it so that it's not just pros? Yeah, absolutely. So this is another thing about launching a product in the VR space. The majority of people that VR is targeting right now, or most of these companies are targeting is gaming with the exception of potentially HP, who has like a really deep seat in the enterprise industry, like actually Oculus, Vive, all of these are, are packaged and branded as gaming consoles almost. So for us to really gather a, a, a wide breadth of users to test once we are outside of academia and more in like the, the remote testing kind of a, a phase, we need to offer something that allows people to get easy access, start using it in a more casual way, and we also, need to make sure our UX layer is accessible enough as well, right? So it's easy enough to jump in and start sketching. And so it's really been a product of that and, and bringing more people into the ecosystem before this becomes like the third display on your desk as an engineer. So we can define exactly what feels right. And going back to that UX problem, our question you asked me earlier, you know, that's what we've been focusing on is, is really amassing a lot of people to the platform, getting them to unuse it, understand how it's used, give us feedback, they may not be our core end users, but they can engage and, and, and enjoy the experience just alike. <laughs> well, I also think it's a great entry point. I've written a lot of articles on this. Tom knows that, you know, that that when you come in at that younger age group, especially, you know, as you're talking about college students, which is fast, fantastic. I mean, when we <laughs> we've told the story on, on the show before, but when we were in college, CAD systems were brand new. So while we had a CAD lab, that was that everyone had access to at Rhode Island School of Design where we went, what happened was it wasn't a part of the curriculum yet mm -hmm. because the teachers hadn't had an opportunity, the professors had an opportunity to integrate it into the programs. So we were at that like cut at that edge of it. And I think that's where VR is as well. It's not integrated into most programs, yeah. but to create that access at it starts to get someone thinking about the design process with it included in it. Absolutely. And what we've seen with it, with academia is We've seen students go out and purchase the headset themselves because it's half the price of an iPad, right? So they've gone out, purchased a Quest headset. Our product is, I think it's roughly thirty dollars on the Quest store right now. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking in pounds at the moment, but you know, <laughs> that's grab, okay. It's close enough. <laughs> so they've almost flipped it. You know, they've they've went out and got the hardware themselves, started to implement it themselves, and now they're introducing it to their instructors. And so we actually get a lot of migration. Uh, from the students to the instructors to us, as opposed to us going out and reaching out to yeah. them. Uh, Same thing in 3D that's, printing, right? That's exactly yeah. the model we saw going on early on in 3D printing. So I think that's really great. So 
while I can completely relate to the, the, the benefits of this tool from a creative perspective and a communication perspective um, and, a, and a workflow in the earliest stages of design, I'm curious to ask a little bit more, uh, you know, on a, on a technical level about your either what you're already achieving or what you're planning to do in terms of workflow, taking it from that sketch to then reality. Uh, you know, I know you mentioned a little bit about it, but a little more detail. I mean, because it struck me from what I saw anyway, while the creative opportunities are there and to realize what's in your mind's eye, I was not really sure how accurately, you know, sized things are. How easy is it to do that in a gravity sketch? Or is that not important? Is it really just proportion more than specific accuracy and does that happen later can, can you help share a little bit about your intention there yeah absolutely so one thing i'll say is whenever you build a tool it's really the users who define what that tool is used for and we've realized that more now than ever with you know thousands tens of thousands of users on the platform now wow. so initially it was very much so hey this is just about form finding figuring out the right shape and proportion and then go and scale it in another tool somewhere else and more and more we're getting people that actually don't have any pre-existing CAD knowledge and want to understand the proportions, the measurements, and this is a real demand. And so what we don't want to do is recant or, you know, recant on some of the things that we said we were going to keep as our guiding principles. And so what happens is we spend a lot of time <laughs> figuring out how do you proportion things and make it feel natural and make it feel easy and make it feel intuitive. And, and, you know, a tape measure, for example, is one of the things that we've been re working with right now. It's still not perfect because how you measure something from a very, large distance do you have to scale it down first or or whatever so that's one aspect of it uh, is that the user starts to define what the actual tool is used for and so we need to address these things another aspect here is we've created everything in on, on top of NURBS which is non-uniform rational um, B splines essentially the underlying maths that's accessed through SolidWorks Rhino and a plethora of other CAD packages so you can export seamlessly into another package Likewise, you can import something in. So what we try to encourage users to do more than try to measure out everything before they start sketching is, hey, why don't you bring in a mannequin, bring in a chassis of a car, bring in you know the rough tooling bed for your 3D printer, and then use that as the volume that you want to sketch within. So that way you understand some rough proportions, but you don't necessarily need to focus on the numbers. So the, the, it, there's an area here that we still need to work on, Tom. I'll, I'll be honest about that. But you know we do capture workflows and we do kind of figure out ways of, of, of going around that. And I think that's where the creatives are best. And, and hopefully we don't need to figure it out. It's the students, it's the creatives in the community that are figure, helping us figure that out. Well, that's fantastic. And but don't get me wrong. I wasn't trying to take anything away from what you guys are doing or have done. I think it's fantastic. Um, I am a Rhino as my primary CAD software just because the age I am and when I started and what I learned along the way. And, you know, it's not perfect by any means either, but it is grounded in finite, you know, tangible mathematics that yeah. you can actually manufacture things that do fit and interface with other parts existing or created, whatever. And so I, I'm thrilled to hear that you can go back and forth between the two because I could see myself easily 3D sketching in Absolutely. your software and bringing it into Rhino and then bringing that, you know, making whatever, um, well, just as a creative process and then getting it to the point from there, having that framework to work with to create something that is, you know, a completely closed object that I can then have made. Right. Yeah. I mean, Rhino was our, is our, is our number one inspiration on the 3d CAD side. It's it, absolutely the way that they've built the product, the way it, like their philosophy. I mean, Bob McNeil, you know, he's been at it forever and he's not a get rich quick kind of guy. He's really bringing a community around the product and it's actually the community that's helping define what Rhino is. I mean, with the recent grasshopper integration and that's something that we want to also build and, and be aspired to. So we want to belong to the Rhino family, but also create a family around gravity sketch of additional plugins in the future. And, you know, if there's a specific 3d printing workflow, you know, who better than someone from the community to help determine how that should roll out. And so, we're, we're kind of in the same uh, line of vision and, and something that we've done to even bring our, our two worlds closer is we've created a plugin. So you can take a gravity sketch file, drag and drop into Rhino. It repopulates like for like using Rhino's CAD engine. So you don't even have to worry about clicking and converting anything. It's all there. Layers are exactly as you left in gravity sketch. And so you can just pick up 
just where you left off um, in Gravity Sketch, but in Rhino. Well, that's <laughs> that's a, a pleasant <laughs> surprise because I didn't I didn't know that uh, researching for this interview. So that's that's really nice to hear. I like the product even more. I know, yeah. seriously. So what, well, what's the best headset? That I'm going to buy here? Yeah. So, <laughs> but you know, the one, before we get to that, because I do want to get to that, but you know, so this sounds like a lot of democratization of design, which I love because you know this is my thing. Like I don't know, someday in my retirement, I'm going to learn CAD. I don't know. Oh, you're but not. now I'm not. No. Now I'm just going to going to go use gravity sketch and like go for it that way or something, you know? So thank you for that. Because, uh, you know, in the back of my mind, I've always thought this is holding back like my vision. I can't get it all the way through. So you're creating the ability to do that. And I absolutely love that. But thinking about that, like how that goes all the way through to it, have you guys, uh, do, are you working on that sort of 3D print process? Because if I could just skip Rhino and skip all of that, then I can go straight into 3D print. Now I can start to visualize what I'm looking at, what I want, and, and you know, assuming it's small enough. But Yeah. Well, that's a good question. And we've actually explored that quite a bit, especially in early days of Gravity Sketch, where, you know, you think about 2014, well, 2015 was that 3D printing year, right? It's a lot of things happened in the industry. And so yeah. it was something that we couldn't close our eyes around. But what we realized when we started to dive into that 3D printing ecosystem was that you kind of have to understand what type of printing you're gonna use, what type of technology, what type of material, and that like you can't really design for 3D printing without understanding that, manu that digital manufacturing process. So we haven't really built in intuitive tools to help you know, go straight from Gravity Sketch to, to printing, but what we have done is for the person that has that, that inherent knowledge, they can actually create a, a pretty watertight mesh within Gravity Sketch and they can then export that as an OBJ and take that directly to, to Cura or whatever slicing software they'd like. We've also recently implemented, or I would say like half a year ago, implemented subdivision modeling, which allows you just to push and pull quads instead of triangles. And that's always gonna remain closed as long as you stitch that together. So you have, a, you have much more confidence in, in the fact that whatever you made in Gravity Sketch will be kicked out to a printer competently. And every stroke in Gravity Sketch is actually a small tube, and it's a closed small tube. So even if you were to make like a, a, a mess of strokes, that's all fully watertight, each individual stroke. So you can print that. That actually makes so much sense when you think <laughs> about it, because you, you're not a two-dimensional environment. You're a three-dimensional environment. So why should any line be just a okay. line in theoretical space exactly. it, with no volume to it. It, it should have some, no matter what scale, it should have some volume. There's, there's, Sounds that must like have I been an epiphany you, there. <laughs> That's that's actually brilliant. Yeah, it sounds like I still might need Tom, which is good. And mm -hmm. we still have a partnership going yeah, on here for the good. 3D print process. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, so now, you know, to get to Tom's question. So like, did you create this so that is it's like tech agnostic from a VR a hardware standpoint? Or did, did you make it device specific? Like, how does that work for you? For you? Yeah, well, again, being in the, the VR ecosystem and, and us raising money as a startup in that ecosystem, we really need to show that we can show, have credible growth. And the best way to do that is to be agnostic. Essentially every VR device out there, we even explored and experimented with Magic Leap in the AR space. And we, ha we have an iPad product that's currently um, in the works so that will come out relatively soon. The idea is that again, it's, it's democratic and it's not to w move towards a point where you don't need Tom and Tom doesn't need Tracy, but it's, <laughs> it's to create a much more synergetic workflow between you two. And so that you guys can actually produce far better products far faster. And so in order to do that, you know, VR doesn't just exist in a silo. It exists next to your desktop computer. It exists next to your iPad, next to your iPhone or smartphone, whatever it may be. And so we want to make sure that we create an experience that can transition between those two different, uh, those three or four different types of devices. And we've, we've recently just created a, also a cloud platform where you can send up the model and then you can bring it down and view it on your phone or view it on on your tablet. Well, that's going to make remote team working even better as well. So great Absolutely. for you. I'm really glad you 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 talk about that because I think that the more successful companies who succeed and and, and we've seen that through the 3D print sort of hype cycle and all of that is that the ones that remain broad in what they do really has created I don't know a a better bridge to the all the things that everybody's already using and less objections in the process, so a better business overall. Um, you have we talked a little bit earlier though about the HP 
uh, products. And do, do you guys use the backpack and the, the you know, yeah, have, we, have you tried them? <laughs> we've asked, we've actually asked HP for a, a loaner. And I think we got stuff with the, um, with the current lockdown situation on, on getting our hands on uh, it. So it yeah, yeah. Cause I'm, I'm, the backpack sounds really cool. And so, yeah. you know, there's some ideas like how much freedom was that, is that going to create in that sort mm-hmm. of process and, and how much fun is that going to be? So yeah, we'll have to, he- we'll have to hear, you'll have to give us a little update yeah. or send us a video once you may manage to get one and, and show us how that that's working. But the last thing that I really want to do is, uh, you know, people like to understand how it's being used. Do you mm-hmm. have some use cases or a use case that you could share with us? I have a few use cases and I, I'm, I know we're a little bit tight on time. But I'll try to rattle through four use cases that I find really compelling and really exciting. Um, there's the obvious automotive use case, which is, which is absolutely cool. Um, we get to be in a lot of really amazing automotive design studios from Italy to Detroit. And what they end up doing is they bring in the car chassis so usually you have like a, a wheelbase that you're going to start from. If it's a combustion engine or electric vehicle, you're starting from some sort of rough engineering um, diagram or dimensions, and then you have safety requirements and all that stuff, right? So you could bring in all that information to Gravity Sketch from whatever CAD system you're using. It's usually CATIA. And then guys are just sketching on top of it, creating like loads and loads and loads of iterations. So they'll create like seven or eight different vehicles as a wireframe kind of sketch in Gravity Sketch. And then they'll have design conferences and reviews. Way faster like, than uh, clay modeling, <laughs> which is, I mean, absolutely. I've seen it because I used to work in that industry. Absolutely. So. But the most interesting and compelling use case was when one of the designers just pulled himself up into the driver's seat and he just, he really did an ergonomic study. It wasn't even about creating the actual design. He just was like, okay, this is how far I need the steering wheel. This is how far I need the shifter. And so it's like the designer at one-to-one scale at napkin sketch phase, being able to understand where things belong in the, in the cockpit of the, of the vehicle. And I found that absolutely amazing. Another use case on the same vein was a drone manufacturer who's bringing in the, the CAD model from, from SolidWorks and they were doing all the cabling. So they're zooming themselves up to the size of the ant and they're doing all the cabling within the model and then exporting the IGES file and then essentially applying the, the, the cabling in, in, the, in the CAD package. So it, they were able to do all the cable routing in Gravity Sketch because it's it's much much more intuitive to do 3D cable wire routing. I, I would think software. seeing what I've seen visually about how your tool works, drawing that line, the right diameter is the cable routing that. I mean, my gosh, it'd be yeah. it'd be perfect. And the two last cases are really around um, the industrial design workflow for the human body. So footwear has been a very interesting use case for us. And if you check our Instagram, you'll see a lot of great footwear examples. But we have, you know, very professional footwear designers from some of the biggest brands using Gravity Sketch to explore concepts. And it's not so much about I need to make this like manufacturable. It's more like I, I'm a footwear designer. I don't really have a, a, a trusted CAD package of choice. I've been mainly working in Illustrator. And now this is something that speaks to me, allows me to explore the 3D shapes that are in my head with one footwear designer who's actually sent over a, a model to a factory in Vietnam who also use Rhino and was able to shave off about 25% of his workflow by just communicating with that factory through 3D as opposed to through really precise 2D Illustrator sketches. And then the last um, example here is, is a little bit of culmination of everything. It's a designer who scanned in his head and he brought up his head in Gravity Sketch and he was able to create a helmet around his head. So the perfect ergonomic fit exactly the, the dimensions of the foam and, and even the aerodynamic nature of, of, the, of the helmet, all custom and tailor-made. And I think that's the future of, of design, 3D printing, and virtual reality, being able to have that, that level of detail and customization. And our technologies are here now. I mean, we've, we're seeing these use cases pop up all the time. So it's really about the designers who want to take, take the bull by the horns and, and run with it. Ugh. Fantastic. Well, thank you for empowering designers. <laughs> hey, absolutely. Thank, thank you for supporting us. I mean, the, the, the community has, has definitely uh, embraced us and, and we're trying to do our best to do the same. Wonderful. Well, um, all of you listening out there will link to the Instagram, the videos, all of those things will be in the blog post for this episode. So you'll be able to find everything at 3dstartpoint.com. And you'll also be able to find all the links also at 3dstartpoint.com forward slash HP. So Shay, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate your insights today. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate your time. Wow. You know, that was just so mind-blowing with <laughs> what Shay had to share with us on, on the design tools and, and how they're progressing. But now I can't wait for us to talk about how they're being applied and what they're doing to create businesses and environments and products. Yeah. So now we're going to hear from Stephen Phillips of Thea. 
Stephen leads the development of Thea's advanced VR and AR visualizations for enterprise clients in the AEC space. So, you know, especially in the architectural space, right? And he graduated from university with a game development degree and multiple honors, but gamification became a big thing for him and use the Unreal Engine pioneered by VR applications that luxury hotel designer designs use, medical facility walkthroughs, real estate pre-leasing, construction site approvals, they have done award-winning product demonstrations. Steven manages custom projects and works with the company leaders to bring the future of real-time rendering to traditional industries. And wow. expensive industries, mind you. Very <laughs> expensive projects. I mean, yeah. this is very, very big stuff. And it's making the barrier to entry to big projects less because there's less surprise down the road. But you know what? I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. You're going to learn a lot from Stephen in our discussion with him. So let's go to that now. Hey, Stephen. Welcome to the show. So glad to talk to you about XR. <laughs> I'm going to call it XR because you're more than VR. Absolutely. It, it covers quite a bit these days between hardware and software and everything in between. But glad to be here. So let's just define that quickly for our listeners how you mentioned it briefly there but can you give us a little bit more about i mean everybody's heard about vr ar now xr so can you please give us just a little 101 on that yeah i think xr is becoming the go-to term because it doesn't matter what you're developing for you're probably going to be developing it in a very similar way and so the xr stands for extended reality which means the whole domain of anything that kind of brings the virtual and real worlds into some sort of blend. I just actually used to think of it as X being like a, a variable, like any type of reality, like fill in the blank reality. So we're not talking extreme reality. We're talking about any kind of reality. I love that. That's kind of, that's broad. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Bringing it the what, that's what we're here for, the what of it. So I love that. So, you know, this is the thing. It's like, you've been working in this world for, uh, for quite some time and how has it changed sort of the process of design? Well, it's definitely a lot has changed really quickly. Um, like my business, we've been doing this sort of VR, XR, AR, whatever it was at the time. We've been doing that for six years. So it, initially for us, we were doing like um, a traditional game development workflow. So like the 3D modeling kind of for the entertainment type workflow and then bringing it into a game engine for rendering. And then once it's there, you can kind of publish it to any particular platform. And so it just depends on, your design process depends on your targeted performance or your targeted visual appeal for these different platforms. You know, whether it's a, you're making an environment that needs to surround the user or you're making a, an object that needs to have a real life environment behind it. I'd say the, the way you go about creating those sorts of experiences hasn't, necessarily change from a fundamental standpoint of, of where you would start with it. But now you actually end up using those VR applications to then go full circle and be developing stuff that way. That, that's kind of the more interesting thing is um, developing your VR apps within VR is now possible. Uh, it's come full circle and it's um, very, it's very exploratory and interesting to be a part of that. Wow. <laughs> that, that's that's a mind bender. Yeah, it really Designing is. Designing VR within the VR Within world. VR, right? Very cool. Yes. So, well, you know, I mean, this is, it, it's interested us for some while. We did an episode on HoloLens um, and we were, we talked, you know, we could not reveal it because it was early on. We couldn't oh, wow. reveal all that we learned and saw, but, you know, we, we, the idea of designing within a VR environment is just a really interesting concept to us. Now, I want to touch base and I want to, I want to get some background on what Thea is doing so that people have an understanding of where you're coming from in this viewpoint. So give us a little background on what Thea is doing. Yeah, of course. So what Thea does is we serve as um, a bit of a services company, a consultant for XR applications. So anytime a business could come to us and say, I have a problem to solve, or I have a thing to be visualized, or I have an application that needs to be built, and we want it to be immersive or interactive or visually interesting. And so they come to us and we can build them out that solution. We, it, we've done quite a few architectural walkthroughs. So like entire properties or buildings that people could actually explore in 3D before it's built. That could serve many purposes. Uh, we've done some training and simulation applications um, for like fixing up 
an airplane or something to that effect. And we've even built an augmented reality video game uh, where you actually get to walk around with a pet dog virtually and toss treats for it and, and play fetch and things like that. So we kind of cover all the bases. <laughs> this sounds like fun. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot less cleanup work. <laughs> in the yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's actually it's, meant, it's targeted for kids. So we almost put in a thing where you were training your kids on, you know, owning a dog is difficult, and you do have to pick up the virtual poop every once in a while. <laughs> well, good. We want it to be realistic, right? I don't know it to be that realistic because the <laughs> virtual poop smells. smells. They're, they're going to be like, sure, I'll pick it up. We don't Can have that in VR. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, you know, it sounds like still today though that this sort of design work is suited for that sort of. I'm going to stay at slightly more expensive model of, you know, it needs to be too expensive to build whatever it is. So we need to visualize it first, whether that's, uh, you know, building out an entire interior space. I mean, I've seen them where they build out oil pipelines, right? So, you know, if you, not only is it expensive if you build it and it's wrong, that's yeah. really expensive, right? Because now you have to redo. Exactly. So, you know, it sounds like we're still in that stage. That is definitely correct. And it is easier and easier to build stuff, you know, in VR. So maybe for, for lower and lower cost things, it's worth it just to get a quick preview here and there. But definitely for, for our business, it's been about the, the huge costs involved. Like, you know, we have people come to us and they're like, hey, we're building a $2 billion casino and there's 200 rooms in it. We need to make sure that every square inch of this can be inspected in virtual reality to make sure it's not a mistake. And so they pay us to spend a lot of time and money on preparing um, that really intricate virtual walkthrough. But, and now these days it's, it's easier to get into that and even we can do it a lot faster and just about anybody can, you know, don a VR headset and move 3D files around. So I would see it being applied to a lot more uh, types of, pro of products and projects going forward. Have you seen people using it to create any smaller objects, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure when you create an environment there, are, you, you don't just create the architecture, maybe you create things that are within the architecture to make it seem more real. But um, how, how much are you seeing people create smaller objects, something that you might be able to 3D print, for example? I, for VR applications, I haven't seen as many uses of that. Um, but like a thought you just uh, brought to mind is um, like 3D sculpting has been around for a while and I've seen people who do 3D sculpting for like jewelry pieces. And there are now more and more ways to do that 3D sculpting within VR. Um, so absolutely that stuff is starting to come back around because a lot of the VR business has so far been about taking data sets, taking big things and putting it into VR. But again, now you can be either life-sized or you could have a gigantic like piece of jewelry in front of you, sculpting it intricately for it to then be 3D printed somewhere else or to be manufactured. So I would think that it's starting to change the design process as you're going through it in a greater way. So you're in, and the workflow of everything. So if we're really starting, you know, back at the visualization, it's reinforming how everything gets to output. Um, what are you seeing along the way of that workflow? Well, for us, um, the thing about VR or these other immersive technologies is that it reveals to you a lot more than you thought about the product you're developing. So we've had people come to us and they just have a very specific goal. Um, a very specific thing that they need to visualize. They say, here are the assets to look at, or here's the purpose for this application. But then once they put on the VR headset, they say, oh, this isn't actually what I thought it was at all. Or, wow. How often does that happen with clients in real life? A lot. <laughs> so. Yeah, it happens a lot. So it's better to do those sorts of realizations early in the process. But we see a lot of those realizations take place. Um, yeah, we've, we've had like, we had someone uh, ask us for a training and simulation experience for a type of hospital room. And then once they were developing that, they realized that because you could interact and reach that some things were actually out of reach and they needed to modify the design of the room. And those are things that really only come out of the, having that sort of immersive experience. Well, and I would imagine then it shortens the build and cost overall because you now have, you now you don't have that, oh, well now I have to retrofit like every single hospital room at this point or try yeah. and make shift some hack to get it to work for people. Yeah, exactly. We've had a lot of those realizations happen where the 3D models were all correct and designed properly, but because you could actually get in there and look around naturally, something wasn't quite the right fit and they went and reevaluated the design files and and it cost them, it would have cost them a lot of money to make any changes after the fact, like you just said, as well as like a lot of customers who are building these big products, like a hotel, they actually build 
physical mock-ups of these things in order to prototype it and understand the hand-reaching things that you can discover in VR. So we can speed up the initial iterative process and skip a couple of those physical mock-ups along the way, which actually has like a very discreet cost associated with it. Yeah, you know, it's reminding me of, you know, my early experience as a designer in practice, and you learn lessons pretty quickly that you've got to get things as inexpensively as possible in the proper scale and in context in order to be able to know what you're going to develop in the long run is actually right. And you, you always, well, I often get surprised when you create something that, you know, on paper or in the computer in CAD, I mean, it's tough when you're creating something in isolation because there's no context around it. And what you're doing is giving people a very realistic context. Yep, very realistic context where you can get in there and immediately understand something instead of trying to interpret a 2D image. You know, even a, even a 3D, you know, 3D software is pretty, available and open source, and there's lots of 3D web browsers that you could spin around like a 3D model on. But as soon as you step into a headset or take that 3D model and put it into your living room through your cell phone, then it's suddenly like the scale of it makes a huge difference. You know, the time it takes to walk around the thing makes a huge difference. I've even had that surprise many times when I'm creating something very, very small. And sometimes objects that I would design and create are very small. And in the computer, I think, oh yeah, this is absolutely the right scale. And even though you have every measurement tool available on earth, and once you 3D print it, you're like, wow, this is twice as big as I thought it was gonna be. What the heck happened here? I yeah. Mean, so we experience it in small scale, but I'm sure you experience it in large scale as well. Yeah, or that, or that medium range. Uh, furniture specifically has been a struggle for us, especially in the early days of VR, where you know, we want to sell VR products. We want to tell people that it's hyper accurate. It's, it's the best thing ever, gives you that great immersion. Um, and yet, because it's so new and, you know, there's technical problems that could arise, we're always skeptical. So we've had customers come to us and say, you know, we, we specify that this chair is exactly 23 inches from the ground on the seat. And when I am in VR, it feels like it's smaller than that. And so I go back to my team and I'm really worried that we made the thing incorrectly and uh, we measure it in our 3D software. We go into VR, measure it. We, we craft a measuring tool just to measure it there. Then we line up a real life chair and sit in it and it's totally correct. It's totally correct. But it's just like that doubt of, you know, it's a 3D object matching the physical object. That is and that's because the chair is probably too short uh, to yeah, begin with, exactly. right? It's actually the chair itself. So this happens so often because Tom and I have done a lot of work in the furniture industry and, and back with my work with Herman Miller and the cataloging. I mean, that's the problem with the visualization tools is that a lot of them were inaccurate. So it's kind of getting this carryover where they're skeptical about what you're creating here. But the reality is, is most of the times they would specify these things out of a visual catalog. They've never sat in it. They don't know what it feels like. And they look at it in the space and they're like, this is wrong. It's like dwarfed in the space or yeah, exactly. it's too low. It doesn't, it's not comfortable. And then you're really stuck with it because you spent eight weeks ordering that furniture to arrive in the perfect material. So yeah, I can see how furniture is a challenge and, and sort of texture materials are a challenge too. So I would imagine that that's part of another complication of furniture. Yep. Yep. Furniture has a lot of aspects to it because some customers are, they just want some piece of furniture to act as a placeholder. But some people build custom furniture and they specified every single material and they sourced it from every different region of the world and they'll ship us samples to make sure we can accurately represent it um, so it can be complicated. Is this technology to the point where you could actually sit on a chair in virtual reality and feel how high off the floor it is or is it just all visual still? You can sit um, with the understanding that if there's nothing there, you'd kind of be faking it. So you'd be squatting down and the measurements would be right and the eye level would be right, but it wouldn't feel the same, of course. Um, you could also line up a real chair with the, with the real dimensions and use it as a proxy for, now I'm comfortably in a chair and I can understand what it's like to see the world from a chair. So you can get the viewpoint, you know, I, so it's starting to make me think about like the opportunities here and, and sort of the, the benefits of being able to use it. But it also is complicated by the fact that as you're pointing out that you have to hand create all these assets. So if the furniture companies aren't creating VR models for you and the product companies aren't, and you know, so like you don't have all of these tools to drop into a space, you also suffer from the fact that either it costs you a lot to do the visualization and time consuming, so then it's not as quick as you want to. So that goes back to like the big opportunity here is that for people to start looking at their, the asset of their creation, 
of the product that they're creating, whatever that might be, whether it's a piece of furniture or a doorknob, right? The, the opportunity of it is to make sure that we start to create three-dimensional ass, uh, assets of them so that they are useful to a company like yours, to that design process, to the specification process. Yeah, and the good news is that that it is all going that direction, luckily. Of course, everyone's design software is in 3D and has been 3D for a while, but historically it's kind of been locked down to a uh, very expensive, proprietary, and awkward like engineering applications. Uh, and not like the that tiny little OBJ file you can send to a friend. Also, some furniture manufacturers can make their models available online just for people like us to use. But then there's like a quality discrepancy or I need it high quality for good visuals and someone else needs it low quality to run performantly. And we're everyone's just starting to kind of have that that arms race and that balance of like what you actually So need. like starting to standardize on, here's the three different sizes, here's the three different model types, here's the formats. Yeah, it's exactly. always an issue, right? Exactly. <laughs> and some people are some people are really pushing that and really committed to creating um, high quality, you know, but performance and a wide variety of file formats available. Um, it is happening behind the scenes. It's all it's all good news going forward. But yeah. I think a lot of this, a lot of this VR and just 3D application revolution has really contributed to that because now there's uh, a lot of free and low cost tools to either create 3D models from scratch or create scenes of other people's models, as well as 3D printing. Everyone just wants to be able to grab an asset and just print it outright instead of needing to build it from scratch every time. So this whole community has really been driven or been driving the industry to come up with better solutions to make it easier to, to use those real life um, references. Well, I, I, I mean, I think that that's always the promise that I saw a while ago when I, I was kind of a VR skeptic. Um, and then I went away, got a presentation, Tom came back and he's like, what Kool-Aid did you drink? Mm -hmm. And so, but it was, it was the opportunity of this idea that you would create such an immersive environment that I could literally grab something and then go 3D print that or grab something and go buy it instantly in the environment, in the gamified environment, whatever that might be. And thinking that makes sense to me. Nowadays, looking at, you know, this sort of uh, sheltered in place world that we might be, uh, you know, that we might be accustomed to from time and uh, time and again, that, you know, thinking about that, being able to be more immersive in our shopping processes and in, in our selection process of things. And that's going to be critical because we can't always go out and get it. Yes, absolutely. And I mean, the uh, the big eye opener for me was when Apple released the AR kit back in 2017 and Google followed shortly thereafter. And now so many retailers or furniture makers like Ikea or, or so many other people now have these digital versions that they're building for all of their content to get it in the hands of consumers to see it in context and see it in the real world and make those better buying decisions. And I've seen a few, quite a few presentations from companies like this who give a return on investment of like, we sold, you know, 50% more products of those that were 3D, which I think it's still kind of the early days to like make the, the final decision on exactly how valuable it is um, in terms of dollars. But certainly, in, especially in this current ecosystem we're living in, but also just from the sheer accessibility of everyone's cell phones that now are portals into these amazing virtual worlds. Uh, it seems like the best way forward to make that get get it in the hands of more people. Yeah, because once I see it on me, I want it, right? <laughs> so, yeah, so exactly. there is that demand level. We we can't quantify it. So yeah, I I see that. I see that as a big opportunity in future. Well, you know, what what would you love for us to uh, us and our listeners to really know about the end, what you're pioneering and what you're working on and doing that that's really going to help uh, all of us learn about how the design process and workflow, and just how how the technology is going to going to change things for us? So the way we've been doing our business um, for the last six years, whether it's incredibly secure training operations or just previewing a house that is yet to be sold, uh, we've been focusing on game engine technology, primarily Unreal Engine, uh, which is free and incredibly powerful for seeing 3D content, creating immersive experiences or video games, whatever it is. So we've been leveraging that to, to satisfy all these customers of ours. And the next steps for Thea is that we're actually coming out with a tool set for Unreal Engine developers to more easily create their own VR experiences. Because so many of our customers or the people that we know really want to build an interactive VR experience where they could 
bring an environment or bring a product and get in the headset and trust that someone else can get in the headset and they can talk about that. But it's actually not really that easy, especially if you're going down the path of something like Unreal Engine, which might require some of that custom programming to do that. So we now, uh, in this upcoming month, in this month, we're releasing a version of our product, Optum, which is actually a quick start to get into virtual reality and see that content and communicate more easily with design review tools and voice communication and things like that. So we're really, really excited about empowering that type of customer. I love that. That's great. Now, how has things like the tools that um, HP's created, and you know, this is obviously an HP. We're not trying to do a commercial here for HP, but we're really trying to make sure that that, that people understand because we've been talking about like the Z by HP, the 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 technology of being able to create texture maps and other things like that. How have the tools that you've been you've gotten there been able to help you? So um, in terms of VR technology, the inside out tracking that you would get with something like the reverb is really cool because it allows you to explore a space pretty naturally and quickly instead of needing to set up a more complicated base station type setup. And it's easy to just throw it on instead of needing to, like in our office currently, when we have so many developers jam packed into one space, we have to actually set up and install and configure all these different things to make sure that everyone gets a consistent VR experience. But with like the reverb, you can just throw it on and it's going to work at your computer. The HP product we actually really love a lot is the VR backpacks because they are not really just good desktop computers. I'm actually, that's the one I'm working on right now um, without even using it for VR. But um, being able to throw on the backpack and just walk around is incredibly free because it's kind of that perfect bridge between um, the standalone VR headsets, which are very limited in terms of performance. So you can't get amazing content, stunning, realistic content on those standalone headsets. But when you have um, a GPU powered backpack on your back, it's kind of, it's a little bit more of that limitless feeling where you can make something that not only looks super immersive, but you could actually run around or, or walk around if you're trying to do something <laughs> boring like architecture. <laughs> you know, walk around and look at all those pipelines. I love that. Well, that's, that's yeah. really great. I'm, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because you know, we don't personally have that experience of getting able to use it. And, but if, if it's helping you in the development process as well as just, you know, that's obviously the end use, you're going to have strap your client into it and make them walk through their own space. Obviously that's helpful too. Yeah. Yeah. It's really helpful for the end client, especially. Um, and then for us, yeah, being able to put on a backpack or just put on the headset really quickly is is great and being able to recommend it to the customer is always a nice thing where we have a guaranteed experience we know that it's a nice tight package and a consistent look and feel and it's going to work exactly how we say it's going to work you don't have to worry about trying to set up your own weird configurations of custom computers or buying one from best buy something like that well we've been talking about vr for a long time like i feel that there's some people out there who are really skeptical and they'll be like ah oh, this vr thing it's never taken hold and it's not gonna it's never gonna tip what do you think the biggest challenge still is to kind of get that into the mainstream process of where everybody's working in sort of a 3d world yeah i think it's always been the struggle with vr has always been putting on the headset um it's somewhat dirty. I mean, now we have to be extra thoughtful of viruses and how close things have been to our nose and uh, mouths and things like that. Um, it's a little bit hot. Um, it isolates you from people uh, in a way. So the end dream is that regardless of whether you're doing VR in a headset or AR on a phone, there's always going to eventually be this blending of the two where you can have ultra lightweight transparent glasses or contact lenses or these days would be something like a hollow lens where you can get the best of both worlds so as far as comfort and usability probably it's it's about that sort of isolation or feeling tied down by a headset and then as far as um well there's also the accessibility of it as far as um price and the price of these headsets has come way down and now that we have these standalone headsets that you don't even need the computer in the first place. It's far more accessible. So that's wonderful news for sure. Yeah. I yeah. would think the cell phone is going to help democratize this to a degree. I mean, I, I'm obviously the backpack is a much more powerful computing engine that gives you mm -hmm. a different experience. But I mean, now we're holding in our hands, you know, a phone that 
has more power than you know was on the spaceships in the late 60s and 70s going to the moon i mean so it's i don't think it's a stretch to think that there's going to be a way for more and more people to experience this coming down to a handheld device would you agree yeah i completely agree um the a few years ago we had uh cell phone powered vr headsets that was thought to be kind of the future and it worked fairly well um, it's long been hypothesized that the way Apple is going to release their first AR headset is that it's a lightweight device, but it plugs into your phone. Because like you said, we have so much horsepower now built into these teeny tiny devices. Uh, you'd be surprised what you can do with it. As well as the other, the other driver, which is more, uh, more interesting when you really dig in behind the scenes, is that the development of the cell phone technology, it doesn't even have to be, the benefits of the cell phone technology don't have to be consumed through the cell phone. So all of those standalone VR headsets are using the cell phone screens and the cell phone batteries and the cell phone processors that have just been mixed and matched and just maybe rebuilt from the ground up. But it all started there on the drive for handheld devices. Yeah. That it, makes sense. Yeah. You know, I, so there's going to be some people who want to see what's going on. So we're going to have some video and some images and other things linked to it from the blog post in this episode. So I want to make sure that you catch up so you can see some of the work that Stephen and his team at Thea are doing and just really get an idea of what this has come to. So if you haven't checked out VR, or XR, or AR in a while, you want to take a look at really see how far this has come because, you know, it's not the rud rudimentary early, early stage stuff. This is pretty detailed work. So thanks, Stephen. Thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate your time and, and we look forward to keeping up and seeing what Thea is going to keep doing in the future. Yeah, thanks so much. This has been fun. Wow, I'm jazzed up about all the creations and everything. But you know, Stephen got us a little bit excited about like, what do we use? Like, we're the tools. So now I can't wait for us to talk to Joanna Popper from HP. She's a global head of virtual reality for location-based entertainment. And she's just got some great background for us. What is she going to talk about? Some cool tools. Oh my gosh, some really cool tools. Something we've been referring to, you might have heard a little bit about, called the backpack. And the HP Reverb. Um, and you might see it virtually behind her, so be looking for that. So if you're listening to this and not watching the video, you might want to go check that video out. And you can check it out on YouTube, or you can go right to the blog post for this episode at 3dstartpoint.com. But Joanna Popper is a Hollywood and Silicon Valley media executive. So she has a media background, and, that, and it's really interesting that she's moving into this heavy innovation. And she's leading their HP initiative for go-to-market and location-based entertainment for virtual reality. So think about what that title says. There's some cool, fun stuff coming up where we can go experience it in person, which may be why there's a backpack involved. Um, prior, she was the Executive Vice President of Media and Marketing at Singularity University and the VP of Marketing at NBC Universal. Joanna developed a TV show partnership with NBC and Singularity for a new TV series on technology and innovation. She's selected as one of 50 women who can change the world in media and entertainment. She's a top women in media game changer and a top women and media industry leader. She is just phenomenal and so excited about the technology. So I can't wait for us to talk to her top. Well, you know what? She's the expert. We're going to hear about it from here. Let's go to that interview. And then Tracy and I will be back with some final thoughts for this episode. Joanna, thank you so much for joining us. I'm excited to talk hardware this time. We've been talking about systems and software, but not hardware. So excellent. Excellent. Excited to be here. You've had some great guests so far. We have, and you know, people who are not, who are listening to this, but are not watching the video version, she's got a cool virtual background that's going on with the headset. Um, so that's the HP Reverb, right? It is. Well, we've talked a little bit about this sort of virtual reality world and designing in it and other things, but the technology, the hardware has really come a long way. Tell us how much that has really changed just in the last few years alone. Absolutely. Yeah. HP, we've been doing some really exciting things. You know, um, as, as you know, I'm sure many of your listeners know, HP has been, this is our 81st anniversary. So HP wow. was part of the forming of Silicon Valley. HP is credited with really being you know, the first Silicon Valley company and creating Silicon Valley to be what we know it to be today. And since then, HP has been all about inventing and reinventing technology and the future. And we see technologies such as 
VR, AR, immersive computing, data science, AI, 3D printing, and manufacturing as being that future of computing. And so that's why HP is so focused on virtual reality. That's why we're investing so deeply and make and coming out with such great products that enable people to empower people. Um, and so, you know, what we're, we're seeing a lot of in virtual reality, particularly right now, is, you know, VR empowers you to collaborate, to connect, to create, to learn, and even to game. And, you know, today, you know, on, on, uh, with your guests, I've been talking a lot, especially about VR enabling them to create. Right? So, um, but at HP, we've, we've had already this, we're on our third generation headset. The headset you see behind me actually is the Reverb Generation 2. So we did our first headset with Microsoft, a Windows Mixed Reality headset that was launched probably two or three years ago. We launched the Reverb first generation a year ago. Um, and the focus of that headset, we, you know, we listened a lot to our, you know, our partners and the industry to see what do they want to see in a headset. And there were a couple of things that really stood out. Uh, and, a and a lot of them really did come from this product development, architecture, engineering, construction, and creation community, which is you know, the community that you're that we're, we're talking about here. And and so what some of those those things were people were looking for very high resolution in their headset. You know, if you're if you're looking at product design, product portent, that the quality and the realism be you know as good as possible. So the headset that we came out with was um, the Reverb Gen Generation One was 2160 by 2160 per eye. So that's 2x the resolution of, of any other uh, lead, leading headset. Um, and so you know that so that that was like what you know, one of the We're talking main ultra real <laughs> ultra, ultra virtual, real yeah ultra, virtual ultra, ultra real, real. Yeah. exactly <laughs> exactly um and you know we were looking at making the headset uh, more comfortable more ergonomic we are looking at you know so especially for 1.1 pounds so if somebody is doing product design review or development and they're in the headset for many hours it's comfortable for them and then it's also easy to get on and off you know it's easy uh, with windows mixed reality which is inside out tracking you don't need external cameras or base stations, and so it's fairly easy to set up. That's what we did with Reverb Generation One, and we we've, we've uh, we now have Reverb Generation Two that's on its way, and that's actually the headset that is behind me. It's a partnership with Valve and Microsoft. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Valve is one of the least so excited that three, you know three great tech companies each bringing what they're best at together for this new headset. Um, and that will be coming this fall. So the uh, pre-orders are already up and ready, um, but we're really, really excited. We took everything that was good about Reverb Generation 1 on, you know, on the resolution side and continued to iterate on and improve on um, some of the other areas you know, together with a part, our, the help of our partners at Microsoft and Valve. You know, this is so interesting because we've been seeing this theme go throughout every interview that we've done with the entire HP team as we've done this series, but we're seeing that these collaborations and these partnerships is just at such a deep level. So, you know, that that integration with Microsoft, that integration with Valve, it's going, it, it's going to take it to that much more deep learning level because you're, you're tapping into the organizational deep learning rather than reinventing everything yourself. And I exactly. think that's so refreshing is what we've been yeah. finding out here. Things, you know, Valve has been in, in the VR business. They've been making, uh, you know, VR optics already for about, you know, and researching and creating for about 10 years, you know, so we're tapping into their knowledge around optics, their knowledge around spatial audio. And so, you know, bringing that to the table, their knowledge around the ergonomics of headsets. You know, Microsoft is bringing their, you know, best in class, six stop, inside out tracking. And the two companies working together we're able to make the integration between Windows Mixed Reality and Steam VR pretty seamless. So those are, you know, those are some of the exciting things that we have we have in store on the headset side. And then on the backpack. I want to talk about the backpack, yeah, because you know, the freedom of that sounds so exciting. Like, you know, because Tom and I have gotten to play a little bit with it. And you, you know, you, we've gotten on some of those ones where they have rigs that you're all, you know, attached to in a grid and you know, <laughs> and then the ones where you feel like you're wandering around the room and you're not really sure if you're okay. <laughs> so the backpack just sounds so amazing in terms of freedom. It is, it is, you know. So the backpack, the backpack isn't a great, great product. It is designed so that you have the full capability 
of you know, very powerful, high performance virtual reality and all the freedom of flexibility of being able to move around. So you can take a tethered headset, so like the, the reverb, you know, with the 2160 by 2160 per eye, so really high resolution, plug it into the backpack, Put the backpack on your back. The backpack actually has a, an NVIDIA card uh, 2080, so super powerful. You know, all the latest Intel gra uh, graphics as well from the CPU side, and you can move around. And you know, they're, they're even used in by location-based entertainment venues to create these really fun environments for people to you know engage with their family and friends with full immersion. And then on the architecture, engineering, construction side or product dev, there's some amazing examples. You know, we had Steven on earlier from Thea Interactive. They actually created for us, for our, you know, one of our big philosophies at HP is we drink our own champagne. So it's not just about, you know, working with partners and clients and having them do VR product projects or products, but we also, you know, also use VR at work and through and in different workflows. And so we were building our new Houston office. We had Thea create what the office would look like so that the employees would get a sense of what would their new office be. You know, and so using virtual reality as a previs of what, what, you know, what they were going to come to when the office opened. And so the employees were able to put on a VR headset, you know, put on our, up with HP VR headset, put on the backpack and walk around the construction site and in the headset see okay, this is where the hall is, this is where the office is, this is the cafeteria, and, and you know, have that experience of imagining what the office would be in the future, even though it didn't yet exist. In, in, but then in virtual reality, it did exist. Well, we're gonna have to imagine, reimagine all of our offices, so this might be a really good way on reimagining the retrofit of the offices, right? This, this is true, this is true, yeah, this is true. But yeah, that's one of the things that VR is so powerful, you know, around, creating environments that may not exist in, in, in you know, architecture, engineering, construction, like we were talking with Steven, or product design that we were talking with Shay, you know, be, having the ability to make uh, pipelines and workflows and product design reviews much more efficient and much more productive, and, you know, in the end, saving companies a lot of money and, you know, very much creating strong ROI. Did anybody record that architectural walkthrough? Is that possible? You know, so I don't know if there's an actual that? video of it. That's a great question. That's a great question. Well, if um, we, we find definitely it. have. <laughs> yeah, we can show you uh, visuals of what the the virtual office looked like. I can I can send those over. Oh, that'd be great. All right, let's yeah. add them to the blog post because yeah. people are, will enjoy seeing what that looked like. Yeah. You know, but this is just you know a touch on all the great things that are going on and and i think the real uh the real interaction that's going on not just with uh hp and their partners and your partners that you're working with but also with the customers and with the access to the customers so in some cases it's like gravity sketch right you know they're the ones that are touch points through to the customers that are working with it that feedback loop that you're creating how do you use that to feed the redesigns and and the information that's a great question. Uh, so, so I'll give an example. Um, with the, the original backpack, we actually had two. And one had, had a GeForce card, and it was designed for gamers, uh, an NVIDIA GeForce card. And one had a Quadro card, and it was designed for commercial. And actually, the story is we first made the, the, the version of the backpack for gamers and started getting calls from our enterprise clients saying, hey, I want one of those, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we want that too. And so we took, you know, the first one, which was Omen branded, we then created a HPZ branded version for, for the commercial clients. And then the feedback we got what you know because there's what was that um you know we got feed, feedback around around the, the the card inside we got feedback around the harnesses the fit and so we took that feedback and then created generation two the backpack um hp g2 version you know taking all the consumer feedback what you know how to improve it and what to make better I, I love that because you know what you're creating is a rich environment with all the partners in it. So the industry is moving along with everybody, but you're also in tune with the end use. So exactly. that's, that's creating exactly. that, that really proper way, but you're not only doing it with early adopters. You're also doing it with people who are 
entrenched in the marketplaces. They're building digital manufacturing facilities. They're like doing all of these things already. So they're they're not just early adopters in that kind of fun right. and, and gamer way, right? Like that we saw early on, which was I think informing some bad technology that in the last decade that we all went, oh, this VR thing is never going to take off, right? You have to tap into the ones who feel that they could use it every single day. Yeah, and then similar story on the headset. You know, it was we we looked at. Um, you know, cause we, we had the original Winamar headset and got a lot of feedback and from all different segments and all different industries and all different use cases, you know, people who are using the headsets to collaborate, to learn, to connect and to game. And what's interesting is some of the feedback is different by, you know, by use case, but a lot of the feedback is actually pretty similar. And so, you know, we, we learned what do people most want? And then we learned what they liked about what we did in each iteration. And then we, and we also learned what they wanted us to keep improving. And then, you know, with, with, our, with our Reverb G2 have really come, um, you know, I think it's, it's an amazing product in, in so far as it takes everything that was great about generation one. And then if you, if you even go on, say, Reddit or one of, you know, <laughs> one, of, one of the different, where we play, you know, all the different places you can get feedback directly from customers as well as the, the great comments on the web. The, as well as the ones where they're not really you know, talking directly one by one, you. the things that people said, oh, I wish this, I wish this, I wish this, I wish it. We basically delivered all of them, you know, practically all of them with, with the generation two. I love that. I love that. You know, I'm, I'm sort of envisioning a world where then, you know, then, and I hate to say this because I don't want to jinx it, but the, the next time sequestering may have ever have to happen, we're all going to virtually gather together and you're going to be right on the tipping point of that. So. Well, we, we actually do. I mean, I mean, we, I would say, you know, those of us who work in the industry and, you know, uh, you know, certainly probably, um, and all of our partners and clients, you know, are already engaging in virtual worlds, right? But the, the use has very much accelerated during this time period. And so just on our own team, we've done, you know, we do staff meetings in VR quite often. We do give presentations in VR. We, um, we, you know, we may have even done some of the product design and quality review for the headset we've been talking about in VR. Um, and then, you know, that's that, you know, that's sort of on the, on the very work oriented professional side. And then on the, on the more personal side or you know, works, work personal side we you know the, all those moments at work where you have like that virtual water cooler whether it's you go to lunch with someone you walk by them in the have a coffee right now we don't have that right because because we're we're, we're you know our offices are, or many of our offices are closed and you know, those of us who are lucky enough to be able to work from home often are right and so um, we're creating these VR hangs where we go into the, some of the, the the social XR spaces and play basketball together, do bowling together, play dodgeball. We can even fly, which is funny because you know uh, even if we were all back at the office and maybe could you know play basketball which, or grab a coffee or do you, we still couldn't fly. So that's so that VR gives you that that superpower to be able to, to fly. Uh, so we even had one of our one of our employees uh, retire from retirement at this time period. <laughs> last year and so we had his retirement party in virtual reality <laughs> i love that wow it's a whole new world yeah, I'll tell you. yeah. it's going to give a new meaning to our, our our recent minecraft and unicorn dance parties that we've had to throw for our two daughters so they're going to get a virtual reality uh aspect next year we're going to have to up our game so yes absolutely <laughs> i love it i love it I love it. Well, Joanna, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you so much for bringing the partners in with us so that we could really have a, a fuller view of what's going on in this XR world and uh, and really get re-excited re about it again. Because, you know, we, we kind of, these technologies start moving, whether it's 3D printing or XR and VR and, you know, all of these different things. And we get a little like, oh, we've been talking about this forever. And we really aren't paying attention to really how far they've come. So thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you for inviting us all on today. It was great. I love what you guys are doing with the podcast. Keep keep it up. It's excellent. Wow, Tom. This we've really covered VR in a broad way, but we've also really covered not just VR 3D design, but we've covered the creative workflow in this process and democratizing design with VR. I love that. <laughs> I was really blown away in many ways uh, by each of these interview subjects we talked to today. And I have to tell you, uh, the first one, especially with Shay and Gravity Sketch, I 
am really impressed and blown away with what they've done, how they've done it, why they did it, their perspective, where they're coming from. And as a rhinoceros user myself for, oh my gosh, about 18 years now, I am really thrilled at how Gravity Sketch is seamlessly integrated to work with Rhino, among other CAD programs, but they have this direct import-export. And I'm dying to use it myself. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to. We were supposed to be able to try out some of these things and go down to HP in San Diego to do that. We're going to make it happen we're and we'll do a follow-up update. Yeah. Sure, but COVID-19 <laughs> presented some challenges there that we weren't allowed to actually go in and spend time with them. So unfortunately, I can't speak from that personal user experience yet, but I'm dying to. When I think about all the different ways and, and what I've seen in some of the videos and the, you know, I've been through, studied in detail on the on their YouTube channel, all the just different gravity sketch videos and see how people are creating objects. I wow. I mean the creative possibilities and and the speed with which you can communicate the idea from your mind's eye to getting into the CAD and the computer is is just so fantastic. Well, I just think even the creative workflow between the two of us would be so much greater if we could have that kind of push-pull uh, actual live discussion about the items before you go, had to go, go through so much design engineering to like get the forms created. Yeah, and, iterations in CAD models. Before you can even things. share it with me right. and then I have my input and you know. Oh, it would ruin be so it. much faster, <laughs> so much faster using Gravity Sketch before you have me change everything. I that's was right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, <laughs> thinking about how great you can communicate with your teams, but that's where Thea comes in. And that's where Stephen was really exciting me. And the idea that really in a post COVID world where so many of your workers are remote and so many of your clients and you are not interacting in person anymore. And we've known that for almost a decade now. I mean, we work more remotely with our clients and our factories and our other things than we do in person. And we always have for the last 10 years. So we've been looking at that for a long time, but anything you can do to make the communication skills clearer and the communication on a product, on a design, clearer in that process means less money and less time lost. You know, it, that's less money spent. It's so valuable in speeding up the process to getting a product or an environment or architect, you know, you know a whole building, uh, pipelines, whatever, into marketplace. This is going to be hugely valuable. And so I love what they're doing there as well, because I think this creates that flow through from, you know, you got gravity sketch at the beginning with the design side of it. And you get Thea in the middle here with this sort of visualization and, and communication to the marketplace and to the customer and to, to your team and throughout that. And then, of course, we get into the technology that's making it happen and the tools and the equipment. And, you know, wow. Joanna is amazing and what's going on at HP is really cool and they've got some really good things tapped in there. I do love that all along the process, everything has been ag uh, agnostic. So like they're not right. even at HP, they're not reinventing everything. They're working in partnership with everyone so that they're creating a more robust industry and, and, pr and products um, that hardware and software that supports everything is more universal for everyone. That's just going to make the world easier. This is what we found in 3D printing and now they're doing that in the VR side as well. No question. The cooperation and collaboration across disciplines and in different parts of the workflow and you know the hardware and the software and all this it's it's really refreshing to see this collaboration and cooperation and it's really going to be in the best interest of the industry as a whole and each of the different disciplines and people it, you know across the entire process so so there's a lot of links. There's a lot of videos. There's a lot yes. of tools that have come across here. There's lots of pictures. So if you're listening to this and you want to check them out, you want to check out the cool backpack and the new reverb and all of those things, you want to see those things, you're going to have to go to the blog post for this episode at 3dstartpoint.com where we've got all of this together there for you. Um, I am excited about our new XR world, right? <laughs> wow, so am I. And, you know, I, I wasn't as excited about it as you were when you came back from that VR conference years ago. we're starting to convert you. But I, I am, <laughs> you know what? I I'm, am being convinced. I really am. And I'm looking forward to using it myself. So, and I hope you're as excited as we are. So thank you for listening to this episode. I hope you've really enjoyed it. You've gotten a lot out of it. But you know what? There's more. Yeah, we're, we're only halfway through our series right now. So we've got more coming, some really exciting things that we're going to shift into and start talking about on the design, the engineering side, and we're just going further and deeper into that. So looking forward to being with you for the rest of this series. 
Thanks, guys. We'll be back for the next episode. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the WTFFF special series brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP. You can access all the resources mentioned in this episode and all the other episodes in this series by going to 3dstartpoint.com slash HP. We invite you to reach out to us on social at 3D Startpoint and at Z by HP and let us know what you are creating in 3D.